All right. So, this is a cube of Hetep. It is also known as a block statue or a black box. As in my last video here, I want to discuss <clears throat> the whole subject in four big sort of sections here. Uh, first, I want to talk about the original concept of the divine cube itself. What is its origins and what were its true or more appropriately its ancestral form? Secondly, I, or forms actually, because there were several iterations of it until it was secondly corrupted, which is to say the block statue, the cube of Hetep, came to represent something political. And at a certain point in history, this political object, which eventually derivated itself into a throne, became hijacked. The black box was hijacked. The cube was hijacked. What's the story behind that usurpation? Thirdly, I want to discuss what the black box became in the fullness of time. What were its main derivations, its main skews, its main corruptions? And lastly, what is the role of the black box in this world, in today, in the modern era? Because, oh, believe you me, you can see it everywhere. Everywhere. It's everywhere in the modern world. So, what were the original cubes of Hetep? What were these original black boxes of religion about? Well, in order to understand that, you have to go all the way back past through the 13th dynasty of Egypt to an uncorrupted form of theology. Now, I'm not saying that theology is in any way correct. I'm just saying that there was, in a previous time in Egypt, an underivated theology known as Ammonism. This was the worship to the god Amen, or Amon. It's sometimes pronounced Amun, Tutankhamun, for example. And the original divine cubes go all the way back to the very first dynasty in Egypt. And we'll superimpose some images to show you what this original cube looked like. In fact, in the beginning, it wasn't even so much a cube as it was practically, literally, a man sitting in, you know, like hunched up. I don't want to fall over here. A man sitting in hunched down on his haunches, cube-like proportions, his arms wrapped over his knees, sitting down on the ground. Eventually, after artistic expression changed, this cube, or this man on the ground in cube-like proportions, became a cube with but a head atop. It's sometimes as being said as with a cloak around the body and the limbs. Therefore, you see the cloak and the head atop of that structure. Now, these propagated through Egyptian art for quite some time, for a very, 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 very long time. These being the original forms of the divine cubes, the cubes of Hetep, they were often portrayed at scribes or lesser known priests, people working in a coterie or uh, the, the pharaonic court. So they were not, you know, the, the great pyramids to the pharaohs, but they were the divine cubes of the coterie that surrounded them. Those would be often found in association with the burial sites of these people. Now, there was something very, very important which happened, and in fact, uh, I want to mention someone else on who, who's on uh, social media and uh, YouTube, uh, J Dreamer Z. Uh, this video, in fact, is inspired by a little YouTube comment I left on a video of his called The Cube God, I believe that's what it was. And I described something in terms of a corruption which took place. Now, he did a great job at exposing there's something going on with this cube in the world and that at some point it was hijacked. It was taken over by perhaps a foreign source of some kind, or, uh, some sort of malevolent force. And 
the force behind this was, as I mentioned in my last video, a man named Akhenaten, spirit of the Aten. And this divine cube, before Akhenaten and the Hyksos arrival, was eventually even derivated into the throne of the pharaohs, not the throne of the English and the French and the dynastic kings of later ages, where you have the wooden throne with the great arms and the great head, uh, the, great, the great backing, but it, just a cube itself to sit upon, a cube itself to think upon. This is where the divine idea of thinking on the cube, thinking on, right? You'll, if you understand the Teflon, which I'll get to in a moment, you think on the cube, the black cube, the phylactery. And this throne at the time of the Hyksos arrival was conquered by that race. They took control of this throne of, and this eventually became an idea because you understand the members of the pharaonic brotherhood i would even say were all members of what is called the brotherhood of the snake the brotherhood of the serpent this was even alternately called the dragon court which is where uh, when you get kanye west who is a, a somewhat woke sort of character talking about dragon energy he's alluding to something very ancient you might not know what he's alluding to but by the end of this video you will know but dragon energy or, or serpent energy, Draco, the constellation Draco, means what this really means. The black box being a metaphor for the brotherhood of the serpent, because like many political figures up to this day, the rulers of that age were involved in secret societies. And the premier secret society of that time was not really the Masons, no, although the Masons would adopt much of this. It was the brotherhood of of the snake, the brotherhood of the serpent, the dragon court. This throne became associated with the serpent, the black box. This is why after this usurpation, many of the derivations of this would become associated with the serpent. For example, the, uh, the brazen serpent that Akhenaten erected in the desert after being expunged, expelled, like whatever you want to call it, expelled from Egypt. And the Brotherhood of the Snake lasted for some time before it came out in the open. And the members of this pharaonic, this pharaonic court, whilst the population of Egypt worshipped Amen, or any god of their choosing, whether it were Horus or Set even, although that was heavily associated with the, Th the Scythians and uh, your, uh, Juji, but well, that's a different story for a different time. They were free to worship wherever they want, but in secret, the members of the, the Brotherhood of the Snake or the Pharaonic government, all in secret, worshiped a god known as Aten, the god, the skewed god of light, which would eventually become a corruption of Amenism. In fact, Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III, would have in private worshipped Aten, but in publicly had a totally different face, which is where, of course, the Janus, the Janist idea of the two-faced politician comes from, but this is uh, much ancient either than that. Uh, so what happened was when Amenhotep IV took the throne, co-regent and eventually full regent of this throne of the black box, the throne of the serpent, he said enough with this secret society nonsense. We're going to go full bore atonism, full bore monotheism, because again, the, the brotherhood of the snake, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with the brotherhood of the snake, but a lot of people in the brotherhood of the snake really did a lot of damage to the ancient world, which through that caused a lot of damage to this one. So the brotherhood of the snake, Akhenaten, said enough with this secret stuff, and he went on a full bore campaign for monotheism. Monotheism to his god, Aten. If you've seen my last video, you'll know about this. And Atenism, this is where I'm getting full bore, uh, this is where I'm getting full into the, the second part of the story, or the second part of the video here, which is the story of the corruption that occurred to this divine cube. Because you see, before this corruption, 
Ammonism, which was the worship of Amen, and you'll notice that Christians still reference this God, this deity at the end of their hymns with the word Amen being the God of light and darkness in Egypt. And touching upon light and darkness, uh, that that's we're gonna. There were a number of corruptions which took place to this throne at that time in history, three thousand four hundred years ago. Because you see, in Ammonism, there was a duality of the feminine and the masculine. Amen was Amon, however you want to pronounce its name. A Amon was an impersonal amorphous deity representing both the masculine and the feminine, whereas Atonism was determined by Akhenaten to be only male. It was a male. This is where the concept of the father comes from in theology. It's directly from Akhenaten saying, our god is no longer the aspect of the feminine and the masculine god, the deity Aten, is strictly male. That was the first corruption, the first skew in Ammonism to Atonism. Secondly, after that corruption occurred, was a pantheonic shift, which is to say, Amen was the high god, the god of gods of the Egyptian pantheon. It was a god set amongst only itself. However, it was part of a pantheon of lesser gods below that divine of the divine of the divine, however infinitely nth degree you want to propagate this. It was part of a pantheon of lesser gods, whereas what would become Aten and Atenism and monotheism was a god singular, the one god, the only god. Look on the back of a Federal Reserve note and you see one god. No longer would the pantheon exist. No longer would any other even lesser deities or even demigods exist. It was the one god. And it was through this that Egyptian empire truly emerged because back in Ammonism, Amon was the god only of Egypt. It was the high god of Egypt itself. However, it wasn't the god of Assyria. It wasn't the god of sub-Saharan Africa. It was the one god, the high god of Egypt alone. And Atonism changed that, saying it's not the one god of Egypt. It's the one god, only god, of the whole freaking world. The whole thing. It is the, one, the whole god of the universe, the god of creation, the god of everything. Monotheism is on its roots here. And that... Even, even Elohim, or e even uh, the, the precursors to what would eventually become Judaism, did not specifically view themselves as having a singular god. So El Elohim, in that sense, was the god for the Hebrews, the gods of the, what were the Aperu, or the Hebrew. On, there, there are several different derivations of where the Hebrew comes from. But it was the god of the Israelites, of the, or the Hyksos, perhaps you could even say, although that would be entirely accurate. But it wasn't the god of the whole world. It was a, an exclusive, what would become the Judaic god to them. But of, of course, when Antonism morphed into Yahweh, Christus, and Allah, these were very different. It's the, Jesus is to the salvation of all people, even who haven't heard of it. Yahweh is the god of the earth. Allah shall conquer all. Allah is the world. Allah is the universe. Very different. And lastly, most importantly, in this story is the corruption of the solar cult into a singular idea. Because originally there was something called the Osarian cycle or the Amonist cycle, which is that at dawn, Horus would rise up out of the underworld, conquer Set, the pharaoh of the darkness, cast him into the underworld, bringing in about the day, bringing about light. However, at the end of that cycle, Set would return the favor, come out of the underworld, defeat Horus, cast him into the underworld, and then we would have light, then we would have darkness. But there was we don't die 
during the night. However, Atonists fleed to their bed at night and went to bed immediately at darkness because they were so terrified of this. And they cast out the darkness. The darkness is evil. The darkness must be destroyed. The darkness set the Satan. The rival is outside of you. And as the rival is outside of you, is external and is evil, it must be destroyed. The darkness is evil and must be annihilated for the sake of light. You could call this Luciferianism in a certain sense. And it was Sigmund Freud who would have latched onto this perfectly to say if a psychopathic character or a psychopathic society becomes so obsessed with the light that they feel the darkness must be destroyed, that is the recipe for a psychological disaster. And you will annihilate the world. The yin without the yang, the light without the darkness is extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous as we have seen what monotheism has done to this world. Look around you as to what the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews have done through the idolatry of this object. They have destroyed so much. And it's not by accident. It is the cat. It is. We are a cult of light bent on destroying the darkness, bent on destroying that which we deem evil and damn everything we deem evil and kill everything we deem evil. That is the recipe for disaster. And that is what is propagated on this world through monothe through monotheism, through atonism, through the corruption of Ammonism. And I'm not saying that was perfect, as I've said before, nor was even Druidry or any religion for that matter, the, nor even Taoism, although these are much more accurate representations of how to quell conflict in human society. As a, a person who I respect, though, wish I could talk to so I could correct a lot of the stuff he believes as false, right? Jordan Peterson says, you need to understand what it means to be dangerous. You need to understand what it means to hold the darkness within your heart, you will never encounter actual virtue without experiencing what it means to turn evil were those conditions in front of you. And it's only through that that you can avoid harming the world. So, part three, what has this become as a result of that corruption? Well, it went throughout the whole world. And I, I won't get throughout the, I'm not going to get into the corruption of the whole world because that would take a very long time. And I'm going to mention a lot more of this in part four when I talk about the modern world. But what it specifically morphed into through monotheism, through Akhenaten, through Moses, through Amenhotep IV, and even through the Amenhotep lineage back through, well, I meant Amenhotep, the cube of Hetep, Amen. Amen being the god of, of the ancient Egyptians, Amen, Amen Hetep, God, Cube, Divine Thought. That's what his original, that's what Akhenaten, that's what Moses' original name meant, was God Cube, was Divine Thought, was the thought of joy, or, or the, the, the deification of joy through the deity. That's the original name. However, then it was corrupted into Akhenaten, or he corrupted his own image into Akhenaten, the spirit of the Aten, singular, one, male, vindictive and destructive. And then, of course, into Atenism. The etymology here is very important. Now, the Jews carried this through, this image through, the, the, the allegory of the black box through Moses to the brazen serpent, why is there a serpent on the cross? The serpent is reference to the brotherhood of the serpent. What he carried out of Egypt into the rest of the world. The serpent on the cross. The reference to the divine throne of the pharaohs, of which he was a foreign bloodline member of that government, of what would eventually become that government. And this eventually, this black box, this reference to the serpent, the Hebrew S on the side of the Teflim, the phylactery, that is a direct allegory to this. Think of the serpent on the forehead of the pharaoh, right? You know, right there, right here, right where, where my owl is here. 
there was a serpent on that headdress of the pharaohs. The black box in modern media is heavily associated with censorship. Remember the black box over the private parts of people you'd see on TV? You know what's under there. But they black it out anyway just to make, let you know and they don't like it. They, they don't think you can handle looking at it. Right? So what do they think you can't handle looking at under the Teflon? Of course, there's the one here, but we'll get into why there's two of them. Of course, this has to do with the hand and the arm of God, J-N-R, Jor-L, Jor-L, and Jor-L of Superman. The hand and the arm of L. Oh, excuse me, the head and the arm of L. But anyway, that symbology is a, a tale for another time. And the, so the, the S, the Hebrew S on the side of the Teflon, the phylactery on the forehead is a reference to that serpent. If you could lift up that black box, not only would you find a little couple pieces of paper under there, you would find a serpent under there. It is hiding something from you. The serpent on the headdress of the pharaohs, on the headdress of Akhenaten, is under that black box, under the phylactery, under the Teflon. It is a reference to the throne of the pharaohs, whether they are going to scream at you, kicking at you, and spitting, and, and, and calling you whatever terrible names they're going to call you. They will not acknowledge, well, if they're halfway decently honest, they will acknowledge this, but although none of them even practically know it. <laughs> so what did this become in, again, carrying this through the third part, what did this become in Islam? People think the holy symbol of Islam is a crescent and a star, which you can say, okay, sure. You need to Google black box Mecca immediately and you will encounter what they worship. Where do you think this comes from in terms of the... Now, Islam is much later than Judaism and it is much later than Christianity, although they will all admit that they come out of the Abrahamic tradition. And the Abrahamic tradition comes out of the Hyksos, which almost surely comes out of the Scythian tradition, which almost surely comes out of several traditions of Northern Europe and the Britannian Isles. But we're going to talk about that at a later date. What you need to know is... Why are Muslims worshipping a black cube just like the Jews? Why, or, or why are they revering it? I mean, it's kind of obvious it's worship, but that's a whole other etymological debate. Of course, in Christianity, particularly in Catholicism, when you get to the perfect Latin 3-4 cross, what happens when you fold a cube out into its planes, right? you get a perfect, excuse me, you get a perfect Latin three across, four down crucifix. Right? You're, you're talking about the understanding, and in, oh gosh, what was it, Revelations or, or the, the end of time, heaven was described in the Bible in the New Testament perhaps, I can't recall if it was the New or the Old, as, as a box, as a cube, whose, uh, whose dimensions were in miles, six miles up, six miles across, and six miles in the forward dimension. I mean, okay, fine. If you're going to make it that obvious. Although they didn't have, they didn't measure it in miles then, although the conversion of the units that they used in the Bible, two miles, was six miles up, six miles across, six miles forward, so... There you go. Talk about that, right? I'll even, re I can't, I'll reference, uh, I'll make a, an annotation on the video as to what the original uh, biblical units were here. But well, that's again, that's for an update in the future. So that's what this became in terms of its derivations, its three main derivations forward out of Atonism into the rest of the world. This is how the black cube conquered the world, which brings us to the end of all of this. I don't mean the end of the world. I'm talking about the end of the video. <laughs> Where, uh, once you look for this anywhere around the world, you'll see it everywhere. It is in the front of corporate buildings. It is in the front of libraries. It is in the, it is in the front of museums, in the front of obviously temples, obviously temples. But it's not just temples. Uh, 
supercomputers are being made to this shape for perhaps economic as well as efficiency reasons, but it's showing up there too. And in some cases, it may be intentional. Obviously, not in all intentions are engineers making cubes, black cubes for, for theological and corrupt reasons, but it ends up that way anyway. This metaphor is highly, and again, this is hearkening back to my boy Jay-Z, Jay Dreamer Z, and his video, which is that this is highly referenced in pop culture. The black cube you'll find everywhere in pop culture, particularly in pop culture per, uh, surrounding, surrounding various images. For example, the black box is heavily associated with, and this is, uh, I, I'm referring, I'm going on, I'm not gonna go on tangents because I can be famous for that, but I am going to just mention that like, the black box is heavily associated with L, which is heavily associated with Saturn, which is heavily associated with pop culture. If you look into the Marvel U or into to movies like Transformers, which call it the Allspark or the Super Cube or the Tesseract, this Hyper Cube in its modern form has origins that must, that must be discussed not just through back to the three monotheistic traditions of Abrahamism or derivated Atonism, but back through to monotheism itself and back through to its uncorrupted, unsullied form to Amonism, to the ancient pantheon of Egypt out of which this, this cube was hijacked and corrupted and derivated and forced on the world everywhere you look. We have to discuss this. In fact, and this, check it, check every fact, but particularly even check something outlandish as this, which is that Akhenaten is even a character in the Marvel U, Stan Lee. I kid you not. It is a Eric Akhenaten, Amenhotep the fourth, God Cube the fourth, is specifically a character in the Marvel U, the Marvel Universe. And in one comic, even, Apocalypse communes with the god, he, with the being, the idea, the force, he calls Aten. In order to how best conquer this world. Thank you very much for your time.